our final speaker for this entire event, someone who's graciously uh, you know, offered to be here. He's caught a flight yesterday to be here, by the way. Um, he was all over the world, and he's finally made time for us. I'm serious. None of this is not true. It's all serious. And uh, next up, we have Rahat Ahmed from Anchorless. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go pretty fast as well. Let's get the slides up. By the way, Fahad is so good at this. I'm, I'm always just amazed. Always just amazed. OK, so I'm going to keep it to the point. Man, those lights are bright. I'm not a product person. Um, I've tried. So I'm an ex-founder. For those who don't know, we spent five years building something. Didn't fully work out. But I've been through the ups and downs of running a startup. And it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But product is something that is so essential in making it work that I've learned a lot of what not to do's. <laughs> now I'm going to combine a lot of that from the investment perspective and tell you kind of how to move forward. So we're going to talk about, we're going to break it down into three categories. We're going to go with the basics first. Solve a problem that needs to be solved. It, this sounds like rocket science, but I can't tell you how often um, I get pitched something that's so obvious. The first thing what you should think about is, if it's that obvious and nobody's done it, it's probably because either the unit economics don't work, the market isn't there, blah, blah, blah. There's various reasons. Don't try to create a problem that you need to solve for, if that makes sense. There are enough opportunities right now, let's say domestically in Bangladesh, where there is no reason you need to build something complex just solve for what's available and in front of you. Now, how do you get there? Well, you got to know your customers. You got to talk to people, right? If you are surveying three people and they give you some answer, it's, you know, you might get some skewed info. But if you go talk to 100, 200, 500 people, just go on the corner of like one of the universities and talk to students all day, you're going to find patterns of what they actually want, right? That's a starting point, but that's far from where you actually still need to be. Building a team who's going to build this product. So what, this goes for product managers, CEOs, CTOs, it doesn't really matter. The reality is you need a well-rounded team. Um, a really good example from our portfolio at Anchorless is a company called AgroShift. Uh, AgroShift has uh, actually your co former co-founder, uh, CEO from Bouet who knows the agriculture market inside and out. Then you have a PhD in engineering from London who knows how to build the tech side. And then you have another person who has a product background. You put all that together, you know your customer, you know your market, you know your sales channel, and you know where you are going to be or want to be in the next three to five years. Scalability matters. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't build a business that has good margins and solves a problem. If you are happy owning a quaint coffee shop somewhere and it's profitable, do it. But when it comes to building something that we want to invest in, we want to be able to know that, hey, you know what? It can solve a problem for not 100 people, not 1,000 people, but maybe 100,000, maybe a million, maybe 10 million people. And if it works, it's possible that it can solve that problem for five other countries. Um, I'm going to mention this because PM, I mean, look, we're in a product thing. People have said this better than I have. Product market fit is kind of an obvious thing. Success stories is one thing that I want to point out. Um, I'll give you a key example of something that we get pitched all the time, and I don't think people have actually studied how bad of a model it is. It's usually service marketplaces. Globally, that model does not work. Yet, I still get pitched this. Why? It's because some of the founders or product people haven't taken the time to understand at scale why it doesn't work, right? So you have to think about that longer term view, not your first 10, 20, 30 customers. They're a good testing point, but over time, global comparables will tell you if these are really sustainable models or not. Now we get into the details. The details are a little different in the sense that they're a little more nuanced, if you will. So who knows what Field of Dreams is? It's a movie from the US about baseball. Anybody know what it is? All right, so this is my number one problem in Bangladesh when it comes to from people who are tech founders. 
Field of Dreams is a movie where it's Kevin Costner, if you know him, he's in a cornfield in the middle of America. And he hears these whispers. If you build it, they will come. So he builds a baseball diamond, right? And all these ghosts of past baseball players come. It doesn't work. You could build the best product, in your opinion, in the world. If you don't have users, or if you don't know how to get to the users, it does not matter. And this is the field of dreams problem I have in Bangladesh all the time. I get pitched so many things that are good products, they're fine, but they don't have a market. Market hasn't been studied, or they don't know how to actually acquire the customers. Or more importantly, the cost of acquiring the customers is so high, it is not a viable business. Hence, and we learned this from our startup, the one I co-founded, the hard way, distribution is king. Get to your users. Figure out how you can get to users the fastest and at the largest scale. Because then, not only do you have a better feedback loop from your users, you've also proven out that it's actually something people want. Clarity of roadmap. Okay, so what I often tell founders that we talk to is, we want short-term execution, but we want long-term vision. Now, why is that important? You could come to me and say, hey, you know what? We're going to be the most dominant player and fix FinTech or fix, fix healthcare and fix whatever. That's great. I love that. Great. Great story. What are you doing today? Now, as you build your product today, you're going to come to multiple forks in the road, right? In a five-year window, you're going to have hundreds of forks. Each of those forks can significantly change what your company looks like at the end of five years, right? So you need to know where you want to be in five years so that when you come to that first fork, that second fork, that third fork, you make the decision that makes your company viable for where you want to be in five years. This is why the longer term vision matters. One of my, this is, this is the answer I hate the most when I ask. So I have a trick question, which I'm guess, guessing I'm giving away here, is I ask, what do you do if you hit 100% market penetration? The answer I hate the most, and this is going to be ironic because uh, Fahad and I don't know if Elias is here, um, is, oh, we, we want to expand to like Nepal. I'm like, guys, <laughs> we're 175 million people in this country with one of the fastest growing economies in the world. You got to think about how else can you evolve beyond that? So the vision could be, let's say, let's say you're a pharma delivery company. You can come and say, yes, well, long term, we want to actually support uh, insurance and uh, maybe even go into diagnostic centers, whatever. That is a vision. That's a longer term vision. Going to another country is an easy answer, but it's not realistic because policy, sales teams, the customer profile, all that can be very different. Now, listen, I love the ambition of going to other countries but let's focus on how we actually take it step by step within our own country first. Have a pathway to a moat, oh man. Um, this is one of the hardest things in Bangladesh to understand so far when it comes to startups, especially. By the way, a lot of this can go for non-startups and more traditional businesses, uh, but this is really, really critical. One of the things that Bangladesh has never faced is a large volume of high risk institutional capital. Now what that means is there are, there's any given year, there's about $100 trillion, that's with a T, that is allocated in different investments. Startups only account for 0.6% of that, about 600 billion. Nothing, that's nothing compared to everything, right? So here's where it gets crazy. $600 billion, Bangladesh gets 300, 500 million max a year. So we're nowhere near the global capital. So if you build a product, and as soon as it sees product market fit, somebody else can actually get funded to beat you with capital. It's doable, and we've seen this happen in a lot of countries. The easiest example that I can give in Bangladesh is actually food delivery, because you've had early movers, but then you had somebody like Food Panda, which before the market correction was with $30 billion, their parent company. They could lose money for 20 years and not blink, right? So you have to understand product market fit, all it shows to a lot of people is, well, it works, there's demand. 
So why do you need a moat or a pathway to a moat? That means somebody can't just walk in with a lot of money and take your business. We want, you don't need a moat that on day one, but you need a moat or an idea of a moat or how do you get to the moat? You need to be able to communicate that. Finally, and this, this is an easy one and you know, we can end quickly. The opportunity is actually building Bangladesh for the world, right? <coughs> Uh, I just came back from uh, Riyadh and um, I, I just did a three country trip to Mumbai, Riyadh and Dubai. Part of what I do in my job is I go, you know, I'm that guy who's like, Bangladesh is here, where we exist. Um, it's really important for people around the world to know that we exist, that we are an engineering powerhouse. We are a powerhouse across the board. We are not vocal enough, we're not loud enough and we're not aggressive enough, right? This is a major issue in our culture. And this needs to be remedied, right? People here, like honestly, I'll tell you guys, you guys should be angry that we are not more visible in the market. Now, how do we fix that? All the things that I said, you can build for the world, right? Uh, a really good example, well, we have a company in our portfolio that's doing this right now called MyAlice, which uh, is a company that was almost all the tech talent is here. The founder is also a Buet grad. Um, and he has a co-founder based out of Dubai, and their fastest growing revenue stream is Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and UAE, right? And we could do this over and over and over again. And actually, Optimizely is a really good example because Shafkat, who built Newscred, I mean, what, majority of the tech and, and HR team was here in Bangladesh? So Newscred is a really good example of that model working. What we need more are leaders who are able to take that step have the vision, and execute at a global standard. Now, that last part to me is very, very important. Always operate at the highest standard possible, right? Cutting corners will not make it work for this one reason. This is a story I always give, and I think it's really, really important. If you are an investor, now, by the way, keep in mind, 94% of all startup investing in the history of Bangladesh is foreign. That is really, really important to understand. If you're an investor who wakes up in Singapore, in New York, in Tokyo, wherever, London, you don't wake up and say, oh, I want to invest in a Bangladeshi company. No joke, most of them don't know where Bangladesh is, right? What they want to do is they want to invest in the best opportunity for them to get a return on their investment. So if we can present something to them that, hey, you know what? This is something that is as good as anything you're going to see. They're going to be like, all right, great. But keep in mind, they are seeing teams from Indonesia, from Vietnam, from India, from Pakistan. And if you're not operating at that level, you're not gonna get that money. But I promise you right now, there is more than enough money that is looking at Bangladesh right now. We need our teams to step up and we need to say we are good enough. In fact, we are better. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, Uber wasn't profitable for a lot of years, but last year they said they did profit. How do you think that happened? Oh, uh, that's a scale thing. But this is a much longer conversation, similar to what it has. So look, when you think about value of companies, it's, it's all about a global capital thing. So you, who's familiar with mutual funds? Okay, mutual funds have trillions of dollars. So when a company can, like Uber can go public, they have to buy the shares. So for a lot of companies, they don't need to be fully profitable even after they IPO, they just need to have a pathway. So pathway to profitability. Uh, improving margins and unit economics, those are what we're looking for. We're not looking for early stage companies to make millions of dollars. That's not a realistic ask if you're really trying to change a large industry that's very antiquated or legacy based. For anybody who is interested in this space, by the way, highly recommend reading the book Super Pumped about Uber. It talks about that product isn't enough. Half of what Travis Kalanick was great at was understanding and disrupting policy. Because without policy changes, none of this would have been possible. Yeah. 
Uh, hey, you mentioned that uh, in Bangladesh uh, we do have the talent to beat like and compete on a global scale across like all the countries that you mentioned. But on a cultural level, how do you think we should we should approach that aspiration? Because historically we have never had organizations or companies that have gone on that level. So if I speak about India, they have had fresh words. They have had mm -hmm. a lot of other companies that have gone on the global scale, prove that India has a talent. So us coming from a background where we don't have that large scale of large examples of opportunities, how do you think aspiration we can get in that mind space? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first thing to realize is that we are a young country. And all the kind of critique that we may have, it's not blaming. It's an evolution. We need to understand that we've started here and we need to go here, right? I would say right now, the way Bangladesh is going, we're going like this, right? Which is great, like not complaining, right? What I'd love to see is, is go like that. Question is, how do we do that? That is, funnily enough, it is 100% cultural at the end of the day. It's a mentality, right? I think one thing that's gonna happen is as you see more companies get Series B, Series C funding over the next few years, you're going to see, and you have companies like Optimize, you're gonna see people who are getting better mentality in terms of empowerment, trust. Look, there's probably 20 people at Optimizely right now who are future founders. Would you agree? And when they hire you or they work with you, they're not going to treat you the same way it's been in the past. Who, by the way, I, again, I don't blame anybody for this. This is the culture we came from. We're an agrarian trading culture. Garments was a step up, right? Um, our, I do think our closest comparable when we look at, I will never compare ourselves to India. India is, is just a weird anomaly. It's the second top per GDP market in the world when it comes to startups and investments. Many things there. The two countries I would think about comparing yourselves to. One is Korea. Korea went through the agrarian phase to a service phase to, uh, or sorry, manufacturing to service to what I call now a culture phase. I mean, y'all see enough K-pop and you know, K-dramas, I'm sure. Um, but Korea, geographically very similar. You got one city and you got a port city. You've got a lot of agrarian still there, but you've got a dense area where they're trying to build really smart people. If you look at Korean history, I think we're probably Korean like 1989, 1990 right now. The second one, which I think is actually more relevant, is Indonesia. You've got an Islamic country. You've got a large population. You've got a lot of similar cultural uh, systems. How did they go to that next level, right? And both of those countries, I, I think, by the way, Dhaka is the closest to Jakarta of any country, uh, city in the world. If you go to Jakarta now, you see, you can get the vibes of where Dhaka can be in 10 years. So I think a little patience from our side and collaboration and communication will actually take us there. I'm, if you guys know me, I'm pretty hopeful and, and, and confident that we will. Thanks, guys. <laughs>